volunteers. When you do volunteer, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great experience. It really is. Before I do that, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, joined the military at age 17 in, in ROTC, got commissioned as a second lieutenant after undergraduate. The uh, Army then promptly decided that I needed more education, and they sent me to graduate school. And then uh, I spent the next 21 years uh, going all over the globe, uh, serving our nation uh, in Europe for four years, Asia for three years, the Middle East for two years. I had the opportunity to be in the Kosovo campaign, the second Iraq war, and then uh, Afghanistan as well. When I finished and retired from the army in 2004, I literally took off my uniform on a Friday and I came back on a Monday in a coat and tie as a Department of Defense civilian for another 13 years. <laughs> I thought that uh, that would get me out of deployments, but no, when, you, when you're a Department of Defense civilian, you actually sign a a contract that says they can deploy you worldwide. So they didn't hesitate to send me to Afghanistan as a civilian. <laughs> I wore a uniform, carried a weapon, same as I did in the military. So uh, so I had that experience. And, and I only tell you that because if you do choose to attend the Peoria Citizens Police Academy, it is an opportunity to serve. I have been blessed to be able to serve our country for some 34 years from the time when I was a young man until I retired recently. And as I came here to Trilogy, I thought, well, how can I continue to serve our community? In what capacity could I use the skills that the nation has trained me in? And then Larry lined up a great program here where the police officers came out and they talked about the Citizens Police Academy. And if you're looking for a place to A, find out what's happening in your community and be where you might want to plug in and serve the Citizens Police Academy might be for you. Now, there was another member of this club who attended the uh, class with me, Jim Forsyth. He's not here this morning, but I'm sure that he'll echo a lot of what I say today and that it's definitely a worthwhile looking into. If you're not interested in law enforcement, the city offers a variety of other such academies. The fire department has an academy and the city itself has an academy that kind of gives an interview of all its operations. So if you're, if you're new to Arizona or you don't know how Arizona government operates, uh, Mayor Beck has set up a variety of great programs that you can find out what your local government does, how it serves you, and if you are so willing, you can get involved. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that today. Feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. I want this to be a bit of an interactive experience. Uh, I'm telling you what my experience was. Yours might be different, but this will give you an idea anyway. This is the agenda that I'll follow, basically the five W's. What the heck is the academy and why should I be interested in it? Who's eligible to attend? Where do we do the training? When's the next academy? Why do they even have an academy? Why do they bother with this? And then this is where I'll spend most of the time. When you go to the academy, what training are you going to receive and how will you receive it? Let me ask before I go on here, has anybody attended this academy that's in the art? You have. When did you go? Um, last year, spring ago. Okay. And then I joined the PPCA. Do you remember that? Yes, I am. What is that? It's uh, the Peoria Police Citizens Academy alumni. And what we do is uh, primarily and the last thing we were able to put for them was re elected bicycles so they can use some patrol areas where cars aren't accessible. Um, we're having actually a fundraiser at the um, Applebee's on March 23rd. If you're all interested, tickets are ten dollars. After that, you get a flapjack, bacon uh, breakfast, and we'll have uh, things there to auction from eight to ten at the Applebee's on 83rd. And we do fundraisers throughout the year to help with the police department. Great, thank you. One of the things that the actual academy itself, there were representatives from that group at every one of our training sessions. 
and they helped get us to the right location, made sure that uh, you know, the training was successful, assisted the officers with what they were doing. So that those individuals play a key role in the academy itself. And when you complete the academy, one of the opportunities they're going to offer you is exactly what this gentleman did, is a chance to volunteer, give something back to the community and serve in a fundraising capacity or in a capacity of just assisting the officers. Has anyone done one of these academies in another city at all or something similar? No, okay, well then this will be a good introduction for that. So what is the Academy? Well, don't think of it, it's not West Point, it's not the Naval Academy, but what it is, is it's a 10 week program that occurs one night a week, generally for about three hours. In my case, it was a Wednesday night, it went from six to nine, and it's open to anyone who is a resident of Peoria. They don't want you to come in if you're a resident of Scottsdale or a resident of, of uh, you know, Glendale, but they do want you to come in if you are a resident of Peoria. And you get to observe, you get to learn what our police department does. Now we know if we followed the news at all over the last couple of years, that law enforcement has really been uh, given, I would argue, a bum rap in the media. <laughs> These officers work hard to protect us. They work for us, the taxpayers. And it's a shame that many of the, the officers have been portrayed as insensitive to the community or brutal or not serving the public interest. Are there bad apples? Sure, there's bad apples in any organization. But I will tell you that uh, when I went through, the chief was uh, Captain Art Miller, he was very professional. He had about 30 years of experience. He ran a tight ship. They have a new captain now. I don't know uh, what he's like, but I was very impressed with the professionalism of our police force here. And in general, uh, my experience interacting with law enforcement agencies in the United States, uh, and I did serve in the Army. I was a counterintelligence special agent for 15 years. So I did interact with law enforcement as well in some cases. Uh, they're excellent. And when you go to other countries, and I've been in about you know, 35 to 40 of them and lived in third world countries, guess what? The police aren't professional. They're corrupt or they're part of the government or they're out for themselves. So we are very blessed to have the type of police departments that we have here. Could they be reformed in some manner? Maybe, but uh, before you start tearing down a fence, you might want to ask why it was put up in the first place. And uh, Peoria police, from my observation of that 10 week program, are extremely professional and we are very fortunate to have them. Now, the instruction is extremely comprehensive. This is not where you sit at a desk and listen to some officer talk and look at PowerPoint slides like you're going to do here today. <laughs> you are going to get out and it is hands on training. Captain Miller was all about getting you out into the field. You're not going to sit there. Yeah, there are some, some classes where you're going to sit there, but for the most part, you're out doing things. Let me give you an example. One of the things I was very interested in as a retired military officer was how does firearms training differ in law enforcement from the military? Well, in the military, you know, we, we always want to bring a gun to a knife fight, right? You're supposed to laugh. That's okay. <laughs> uh, we want to use overwhelming force, and I was always trained to use overwhelming force to defeat the enemy. But law enforcement's different. You want to use minimal force because you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to hurt unnecessarily. Is the firearms training itself Similar, sure. I mean, you're going to learn all the procedures, you know, of firing a firearm safely. But then you're going to learn how to engage it in a different manner. So I give this as an example. We spent a whole training session going through computer simulations of firing a weapon in real life situations. For example, we had hostage situations. We had a school shooting. We had a routine traffic stop. We had a drug bust. Did that for hours. 
And then in a future training session, we went to their range and we fired their real weapons. In this case, it was a Glock uh, 17 uh, Gen 5 is what they, they use in Peoria. Uh, and you got to see how that was and you got to fire the weapon. And it went everywhere from people who had experience like myself to people who had never touched a weapon before and they got to do it. So if you're looking for hands-on training, this academy is for you. If you're looking to just sit there and, and uh, you know, look at slides and commiserate about it, it's probably not for you. You have to have some physical fitness to be able to go through the academy. But if there's something you can't do, they will uh, try to modify it for you. Or you, know, you can sit out certain levels of the uh, training. It's a great experience. You're going to have an, an, a great view uh, from behind the scenes uh, of what our law enforcement does. And you're going to get to know some of the officers as well. And that's very exciting and very rewarding as well. So any questions at all about what the Academy is? Okay. Who can attend? I mentioned this earlier, but they do want Peoria residents. So anybody here in Trilogy obviously can attend. If you're 18 years of age or older, you can go. If you're under that, they have another program uh, for the youth that you can take a look at. Perhaps you're interested in law enforcement. There were some people in my academy that uh, wanted to become law enforcement officers, and they thought that this was a good way to start to see if it was something that they wanted to pursue in their lives. But you don't have to be interested in a career in law enforcement. If you just want to see what your law enforcement organization does, and you want to have the time of your life, hey, this is a great academy to go to. I had a blast, and I met a lot of interesting people, and I would highly recommend you consider it. So that's who can attend. Where's the training? I didn't know this. We actually have two police headquarters. Uh, there is one, the main headquarters, which is on the left, you depicted there is down on Cinnabar Avenue, and that's where most of the city administration is located. And that is where most of the training occurred as well, at least in terms of classroom training. But we also have a northern station, which is not too far from the our four corners, <clears throat> where the target is, where the Home Depot is, etc. I didn't even know that was there. We had some training there as well, and I understand that there may be correct me if I'm wrong here, that they are going to build an annex up here in this area as well. So they're going to have a third station. There's about, uh, there's several hundred police officers here, and I think they have a few vacancies, but they, Peoria was very smart. As the chaos was occurring in some of the big cities out east and in the Midwest, uh, Chief Miller decided to recruit in New York City and Chicago. So several of our Peoria police officers are former NYPD, former Chicago PD. They're very well trained, very skilled, and they wanted to get away from the cities that were not supporting law enforcement, and they wanted to come to a state or a community where law enforcement was respected, given the opportunity to do its job, and where people cared about the law. I first came to Arizona. I was right out of graduate school and I got assigned to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is about an hour south of Tucson down in Sierra Vista on the Mexican border. And the first thing I noticed I got there in January was there were people sitting out by the pool. And I'm like, oh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, it's probably 20 degrees there. And here it's like 80 degrees. There's something good about the state. But the other thing that I noticed, and, and incidentally, I met my wife there. She's a retired army officer too, who also began her training after college at, uh, at Fort Huachuca. But we noticed that people were carrying firearms. In Sierra Vista back in the 1980s, I'd say 50% of the population was carrying firearms openly on their hip. I'm saying, this is a great state, man. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Uh, things changed. We had an influx of people from other states, some with, uh, with different views of firearms. And it's not as prevalent as it was. but my point is that uh, Arizona is generally a gun-friendly state. 
And the police understand you have a right under the Second Amendment to bear arms, and you have a right to have a concealed weapon as well. And they, I will tell you that they are supportive of that. They are supportive of that. Okay, so I've told you where the training is. Some of the training does occur outside. In fact, a fair amount of it does occur outside. Uh, it's at night, so it's cooler. We had pretty good temperatures when we were there as well. So it turned out to be a, a good experience. Welcome. Come on in, please. Just pole dancing. This is it. <laughs> you are here to do that. Are, are you going to demonstrate for us? Yes. Okay. As long as it's not free stuff. <laughs> So I went through the academy last fall, and there is currently an academy going on right now. As a matter of fact, it started in February. But there will also be a class next fall. The date's to be determined. But you can look online, and you can see when they're going to offer it. That they generally... Uh, Post that, and if you can't find it online, I've given you a phone number. I know Larry always posts these slides. So if you're interested, you can call and say, hey, you know, I want to be considered for the uh, academy. Now, let me tell you, it's since it is a volunteer academy, there are a lot of people that are interested, and the slots fill up pretty quickly. So uh, Larry had made a, a friend with one of the officers, kind of gave me and Jim, the other member of our club who attended, a heads up that, hey, on this day, we're going to post it, the openings, and you can sign up. And I'd say very quickly, all the openings were filled. So if it's something you're interested in, you need to find out when they're going to post the openings and sign up right away. Don't wait or you'll miss the opportunity to go. You don't want to miss this class. Definitely worth it. So why do we even have a Citizens Police Academy? What what is the purpose of it? Well, there, there's more, several purposes for it. Our local police force supports community-oriented policing. Does anyone know what community-oriented policing is? Anyone want to take a stab at it? I'd like to have those watch groups maybe in your neighborhood. That's certainly on. an aspect of it, Jim. Absolutely. What, what else would be community-oriented? Well, think about trilogy here a little bit. We know generally who belongs in trilogy and who doesn't. If you are seeing, you know, a young person who's not here working and they're checking out cars and checking out doors, I mean, you're going to spot it, right? That doesn't mean that person's necessarily a criminal, but it's certainly something to observe and it's something you can know. You're going to see things happen that the police are not necessarily, they can't be everywhere at all times. So the Peoria Police Academy uh, and the Peoria Police espouse a view of community-oriented police. We're responsible for helping secure our community. If you see something, say something. You'd be amazed at how many uh, tips the police get that actually lead towards action and prevention of crimes. Our police I believe it's an equal exchange of information between the citizens and the law enforcement officers. It is an interaction. And I found that out with all the officers I interacted with. Uh, they want to serve the community. They want our feedback. They want our support. They don't want to be authoritarian thugs that tell you what to do. And I'm telling you, again, from my experience living in those third world countries, that's the way a lot of the world is. And we are very fortunate that we are not that way here in the United States and not that way here in Florida. <laughs> so on the one hand, it's assisting the police, okay? But on the other hand, it's for you. You're a resident. You pay their bills. You're a taxpayer. It's your police organization. You want to see what it does for you? You want to see how it really operates, not the propaganda you, you see sometimes in the media, not what the criminals tell you, not what the defense attorneys say. I mean, sure, they have a viewpoint. They're entitled to it. But if you, you don't always get the whole picture when you just watch the media. 
And here you're going to see the other side of the coin, so to speak. Hear their stories. Hear what they do. Hear their perspective. And I found that to be, I mean, the training is great, but the interaction with the officers is what I found really useful. And getting, you know, I would tell you one of the things is if you go through this, you're going to be given the opportunity to go on a what's called a ride-along, where you are sitting in the police car going with your officer. And it's not a ride-along for an hour. I went for the whole shift. It was when all was said and done, we had an arrest. By the time we got the guy booked and shipped off to jail, probably a 14-hour ride. You see what? Yes, sir. You're in the front seat, not the back seat. That's correct. You're in the front, you know, it's funny because uh, the, the army, the army's prison. And for this gentleman who came in, I'm a retired army officer. Uh, the army has its main prison facilities at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, right? But it also has its graduate school at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So I was at the I always tell people, you know, hey, I was at Leavenworth for a year, but I have to say, no, I was at the Command and General Staff College. I wasn't in the prison. But they do have a heck of a bakery there. I'll tell you where you go. You get it on it, man. You'll love it. But you want to see how the, the department truly operates. And this is going to give you a chance. So on the one hand, you're assisting in the security of our community. On the other hand, you as a citizen are seeing how things truly go. All right, here's where I want to park for a while and talk about talk about the training. And it starts at the very beginning. How do most people, if you're not if you're not a criminal or if you're not being pulled over for perhaps a traffic violation, a lot of the way that our interaction starts is with picking up our phone and dialing nine one one. How does that work? Have you ever thought about that? They have an entire communication center here in Peoria where there are people that answer those calls. And we got to observe, go actually go into that center and see real calls come in, the professionalism of the people that receive those calls. And, you know, they're often the very first line of defense. So somebody calls in and they're panicked. Hey, my house is being robbed. Hey, I'm being assaulted. What am I going to do? Those people that work in that call center are a calming influence. They're very professional. They ask the five W's, the who, what, where, when, why. They get the data. They have a board where it shows all the police officers' location. They are able to dispatch you know, a police officer to the scene to assist. But it's not as simple as just picking up a phone, somebody answers and the police come out. It's an entire network that is finely tuned, interactive, and uh, ready to respond. There is one thing that I did find a little, I guess I would say concerning. And it, it, the 911 center made me think about it, but I think it pertains to all of our law enforcement operations here. But it also pertains to a lot of our life right now. Everything is electronic. I wanted a hard copy map of the city of Peoria. Police don't have one. And they have one, but it's about seven years old. <laughs> Everything they do is on a computer screen with a map. Now I will tell you, I'll give you an example from the army artillery. When I was a young officer, we learned how to call an artillery manual. You plotted it on a map. You had a, a, a compass. You had, a, you could do it all manually. That transition and everything was done electronically. Well, guess what? The young, a lot of the young soldiers now, they couldn't call in artillery manually if they had to. What's going to happen if an enemy knocks out the electronics? Yeah. In wartime, it can be catastrophic. But here in the city, and I asked him, what's the backup plan? I mean, yeah, they have generators. Okay, but what if you don't get fuel after a while? Then, then what happens? And what if the internet's down? That's a vulnerability. They need to think about that. So my point, again, in, in bringing that out is how responsive the call center is, how professional its members are, but it is largely based on electrons. What's going to happen when you dial 911? And nobody answers. Are you ready for that? Thought about that? <clears throat> Going through the academy might, might get you to think about some of the steps you might want to take to protect your family, to protect your community, to be ready. 
if the police can't come. But that's another class. All right. The next thing is, after you see how the calls come in, and I'm not giving you just some representative examples. There's probably about 50 different topics, but I'll go through these. Is the proactiveness, the responsiveness that our police exercise when helping a victim. So many times nowadays you hear about the prosecutors in certain cities who support the defendants so much that they A, won't prosecute or B, give every right to a defendant. And we should have our rights as a defendants, we should. But what about the victim? What about the person who's been assaulted or raped or robbed? Well, they have a unit, very professional unit. It gets to the scene right away, interacts with those victims. And if they need immediate assistance, you know, medical assistance, mental assistance, uh, spiritual assistance, they get that. But it doesn't end there. They link them up with long-term services if they need it. Because the victim is often forgotten, aren't they? Crime occurs, the police respond, you know, everybody watched cops when they were younger, right? That's the glamorous stuff. But what about that woman, you know, six months after she's been raped? What about you, three months after your Ferrari's been stolen? Oh man, this is a tough audience. <laughs> hey, I'm going to go put my bulletproof vest. There are no bulletproof vests. You know that, right? They're bullet resistant vests, but they're not proof. Anyway, that's another class, too. Uh, so, my, what I wanted to emphasize there was they want to help you as a victim. And you're going to see how that, how they do that, how professional they are. If we're not dialing the phone 911, the other way we generally interact with law enforcement for law by citizens is they're pulling us over because we went a little too fast on the 303. Maybe we got a little impatient at stoplight. Maybe we roll through a stop sign and they're going to pull you over. <clears throat> what I noticed in the traffic stops was if you're polite to the officers, they ask you, hey, why do you think I pull you over? You can be you can be a jerk and say, I don't know, why don't you tell me? Or you can say, sir, okay, I rolled into the stoplight. If you're honest with them and you're respectful to them, what I saw was they may not give you the ticket. Okay. If you're a jerk, or you, you know, or you did commit the crime, and yeah, they, they might give it to you, but <clears throat> The main focus of traffic investigations and traffic control is to make the roads safe for all of us, okay? Not to make money, not to pull people over. But if you are making the roads unsafe, then yeah, they're going to enforce the traffic and you're going to interact them. Uh, here again, in an open carry state and, and where a lot of people are concealed carry, where do you want to put your hands when you get a traffic, uh, when you're pulled over? You want that officer to see your hands? Probably a good idea, right? Traffic investigations, another way that we interact with our local police force. Oh, Don? Yes. So do the police have a quota of uh, tickets to I do every shift? I don't they do. They don't. I sign in on their briefings and uh, no, I don't think so. I, I don't believe they do. <clears throat> Criminal investigations. That can vary. That's obviously a lot more serious than the traffic investigations. And you're going to get uh, some training on how they do those criminal investigations, what uh, sources they use to investigate those crimes, how they pursue them. What do you think is uh, some of the greatest crime here in the Peoria area in terms of the value of the crime? Property. Getting robbed, yeah. Drugs. Those are so good. Go ahead. Ah, there you go. It's cyber crimes. Wow. Cyber crimes. Now, they gave an example. This didn't occur in Peoria. It occurred in <clears throat> Scottsdale. But a cyber crime, a couple lost $800,000 oh, out of their accounts because they were unwitting victims 
of a cyber crime. So in the old days of a criminal investigation of just you know, walking the beat, pulling somebody over, doing a, an investigation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they still do that, but it's much more expensive. And another thing is it is much more interdepartmental. If cybercrime is one of the highest crimes in this area, Peoria, as a law enforcement agency, they're simply not equipped to handle the level of some cybercrime. Do they have a cybercrime section? Yes, I think they have two officers in it, something like that, two. So they have to interact with other law enforcement agencies. If it's interstate, they're going to interact with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If it's drug related, they're going to interact with the Drug Enforcement uh, Agency. Uh, there's a variety of things that they can do, but criminal investigations are uh, much more extensive, I think, than they were maybe 20, 30 years ago. And you're going to get to see how some of that occurs and hear from officers who have been doing it. And it's really interesting in the Peoria department because at least the gentleman who taught the course when I was there, he'd been doing it for like 30 years. So he's seen it the old school way. And he sees it the new school way. And he sees how <clears throat> crimes have developed and merged over the years. And he can talk about that in great depth. So you can, you can see that as well. Uh, let's talk about an immediate issue, crisis negotiations. I said earlier that while the military uses overwhelming force, law enforcement tends to use minimal force. <clears throat> and part of that is if we can talk our way out of a problem, if the police can talk their way out of a problem, they want to do that. And they have professional negotiators we're going to talk, let's say there's a hostage situation, drug situation, but the guy's got his girlfriend in the house. They've got trained negotiators that will interact with those individuals. And I'll just give you a sneak preview as to one of the cool <clears throat> gadgets that they have. And I'm really, I'm amazed because I was an intelligence officer. And we had you know, all kinds of gadgets to do all kinds of things. I was shocked at some of the equipment that law enforcement has. I mean, it's military grade equipment. Can they, uh, for example, they can do thermal imaging through a wall. You think you're hiding in a house as a criminal? No, they can tell you that. They can shoot a ball into the, into the residence. It will be a listening device. It will be able to hear everything that's going on in there. Hmm. They can send a phone in to you so that they can have direct talks with you as the criminal. But the bottom line there is they want to use minimal force. They want to try to talk the criminal out of it. They want to de-escalate the situation if it's possible. But if that fails, they have a SWAT team with snipers ready to blow your head off. That's the harsh reality of it. So they have both. They have both. And you learn about that. Firearms safety. I thought this was a, a really good course. For us in the gun club, you know the four aspects of, of, of gun safety. We treat every weapon as if it's loaded. We never point our weapon at anything we don't want to shoot. Keep our finger off the trigger until we're ready to engage the target. And we're mindful of what's behind and beside the targets. And they're going to start with the basics with you and then walk you through that. They're going to teach you how to handle firearms safely. You're going to go through simulations where you are uh, as I said, you might go into a school shooting situation, a computer simulation, and you'll do that. It's a lot. Of, was anybody here when we went up to the Scottsdale Gun Club and did, uh, did that? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, they have, the police have one that's even cooler than that. That's for sure. You won't shoot zombies. You'll be in actual real life situations and you'll have to decide. And then they show you, if you use your firearm, they show you where you would have hit if you had actually fired those rounds and uh, if you were successful in in targeting the assailant if necessary or if you hit an innocent civilian. You know, it's amazing what these law enforcement officers have to decide in split seconds. And you get to experience that when you're in the academy. Oh, well, he shouldn't have shot that criminal. Really? Why don't you try it? And you have half of a second to decide whether to shoot or not. And there's some an innocent person that might get harmed. I found that fascinating. And then a whole whole night where we were at their range. 
firing their weapons. Want to burn up somebody else's ammo? Hey, it's a great place to go. Fire their ammo. You know? And you don't even have to clean the weapons. What weapons they use the Glock 17 uh, Gen 5. Is what they use. I don't know. Does anybody have the, the Glock 17 Gen 5? I tried to get one after the Academy. I liked it so much. And Glock stopped making it. And they're making uh, the substitute for it is the 47. Uh, I bought one of those. And some of our law enforcement agencies are using those. I don't like it as well. I don't think it's as good. So if you have one, hold on to it. It's a great weapon. Uh, anyway, you'll get to use that. Another thing that we did was uh, we didn't get to fire uh, rifles, but we were trained and had a practical uh, exercise in hostage rescue and, and uh, clearing buildings. I actually was given an AR-15 uh, with... Um, Oh, I forget what it's called on the civilian side, but it's basically lasers mounted on it. Miles, if you're familiar with the military, it's called Miles Equipment. Anyway, military integrated laser or something system is what it is. But they had targets set up throughout this warehouse. You know, they had friendly people. They had phones set up and you went in. You were clearing room by room, firing at the targets. They tell you if you hit it or not, tell you if you shot somebody you shouldn't have shot. Uh, just fascinating. So it wasn't limited to just sitting in a classroom learning about a weapon. You got to learn about the weapon and safety in the classroom. You got to go do a computer simulation. You got to go do a live simulation in the warehouse. And then you got to go to the range and fire your weapon. So gun club members, you know, shooting at a paper target in a shooter's world. Shooter's world is that here? Yeah, I was forget my range here. But anyway, shooter's world. It's great, good training. Is that how you're going to fight? No. I'm going to stand, have 10 seconds to decide to engage that paper target that's not shooting back at you. You're going to have maybe two seconds, maybe a second and a half. You're going to be moving. The target's going to be firing back at you. Maybe you're going to get a chance to experience that. It's a lot different. It's a lot different than shooting at a paper target from a standing position. Use of force and defensive tactics. I've already alluded to this. De-escalation is the goal. And they're going to teach you that. Uh, minimal use of force is the end state. Use the minimal level of force to accomplish the mission. Okay. Don, did they show you non-lethal weapon usage? They talked about it a little bit. And we did learn some things like they had a practicum on handcuffing. Assailant, you actually were given a pair of handcuffs and you tried it on your buddy in the class and did it several times. They didn't, I forget what that weapon is called that uh, fires like the ball out. It begins with a B, I think. Anybody know what that is? BB gun? No, it's not. It's like almost like a bean bag. Yeah. But no, they didn't really go over that. They did do a little bit with the old nightstick. Wands. It was on people. Baton, right? Because there's very few problems in this world that can't be solved with a German shepherd. Nice. <laughs> right? uh, but no, that, that was one thing they didn't do a lot of. It, that's a good point, Larry. That's a good point. Canine. We have a great canine core here in Peoria. Uh, several dogs. And this was a really cool class. Uh, the way they started the class was they brought this dog in. And the dog was facing, you were facing the dog. What you didn't realize was behind you, a man was coming up dressed in the full protective garb for when a dog attacks him. And the police officer said to the dog, you know, go get him. And the dog's come running right at you. I'm like, oh, diving out of the way. I mean, that was, you know, literally ran right. I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing's coming at me. Uh, but no, it went and got the guy behind me. Uh, that, that was very, very good. And then we got to see them, many of the, the skills that the canines do. And it's not just taking down a person. Actually, the main skills that they taught us with the, with the dogs is uh, drugs. Drugs. And sadly, there is a drug out there, and I forget the name of it. You even inhale it or even it gets on your skin, and it's common now. Fentanyl. Fentanyl. 
Yeah, it's fentanyl. And they have the dogs are trained to sense the fentanyl. And each police officer carries a kit to treat fentanyl. And there was a case of a, a one-year-old who ingested some fentanyl. Thought it was like I guess they thought not a one-year-old, one or two-year-old. Thought it was an M and M or something. And the, the dog was able to note that it was fentanyl, and the police officer was able to administer the treatment on this infant to the infant's life. Although that treatment had not been certified for a child. Did it anyway because the child was going to die to save the child's life. So the dogs, uh, not only can they maintain crowd control, they can help search vehicles, they can detect drugs, and they can sense things that uh, that a lot of us can't. So, for example, let's go back to the situation where you might have a drug dealer in a house or a hostage situation in a house sent the crisis negotiator out there. You've got them talking. Uh, you can send the dog in. And this is interesting. You know that the dogs generally don't attack other dogs. So if you have, you know, Fifi in your house, police dog comes in, they're actually trained generally, unless those dogs intervene, to leave your dog alone. That's kind of a myth where they say they kill your dog. Oh, that's not true. At least that's what the law enforcement officers told me. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> But they can go and uh, they can go throughout the house. You could put a camera on that dog. You can augment that. They have a quite an extensive drone force here in Peoria. So they can use the drones in conjunction with the dogs, in conjunction with the thermal imaging. And they can get a pretty good lay down of where uh, the criminals are. OK, animal control. I didn't know this. And in most cities, this isn't the case. Animal control actually falls under the Police department here in Peoria. So if you have a raccoon in your backyard, I owe you whatever. You can call animal control and you're going to get the police department. They won't come out for rattlesnakes, though. They won't. Mm -hmm. They'll come out for rattlesnakes. That's true. Just for the Glock 17. <laughs> <laughs> I have a view on that, but I'll keep it myself. <laughs> there might be some animal lovers who think. That was thanks to the good thing. Uh, yeah, a good thing, but not in my back. Okay. All right. So this was just a smattering of uh, what there's much, much more that goes on there. And I would encourage you that if you are even remotely interested, that you consider attending one of the academies, whether it be the police academy, the firefighters academy, the city's academy. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to make some friends. I met another person who lived in Trilogy. They're not a member of the gun club, but she was going through the course too. Great. Great to have her there. All right. I've talked now. Larry says I've only got about four minutes left. I've talked for about 40 minutes. What else can I explain? Yes, sir. Your resources are available to reduce somebody else's. We don't currently, but Mayor Beck is purchasing a uh, helicopter for the police force here. So we will have it soon enough. We do have uh, agreements with other police forces to use uh, rotary wing assets if it's required for the mission. Good question. Yes, sir. So they have an undercover unit too. They do. And uh, you're going to see them. They're especially focused on the drug mission, but not just that. Uh, yes, they look like hippies from the 60s. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, they were great, but they were very professional and they knew what to do. Excellent question. What else can I answer for you? Anything about the police academy? Got about three minutes. Anything about the military? Huh? Yes, sir. I'd like to say one thing. I did the academy also, and uh, it's five weeks. It's only in the fall. It's filled up 